am so glad that he would not come down from the cross just to save himself, but he decided to die to save you and me. Will you pray with me today? God, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I tell you how God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways, not our ways? I don't care who you are, where you've been, or how much learning you think you have. It pales in comparison to the Almighty God. And contrary to popular belief, all those who think they have a handle on the mystery and majesty of God and have the audacity, the nerve, the nerve enough to dare say what God thinks, how God loves, who God hates, how God acts, when it stems from the fact that God's thoughts, God's actions, God's loves, mimics conservative ideologies, exclusivity, anthropomorphic, or manly ways. You better be aware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Follow me to the gospel accounts as recorded and remembered by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This story is so important that it appears in all four of the Gospels. And if you don't know this story, shame on you. Somebody sure enough have betrayed your faith. Now use your sanctified imagination. And for today's purposes, we'll zoom in on the Garden of Gethsemane. Anybody ever had a Gethsemane moment where you prayed so hard that sweat beads became drops of blood, all in the garden alone, having an argument with God, not really wanting to face what was beset, but knowing fully well, God knows God's business better than any of us. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, lest we forget Gethsemane, and he had the disciples come to stand watch while he went up a little further to pray. Well, I wanted to know what the word watch means. And its original meaning is to be vigilant, to stand guard, to be awake, and to be woke. As Huddy William Ledbetter, whose stage name was Led Belly, sang an ode to the nine black teenagers and young men who were between the ages of 13 to 20, affectionately known as the Scottsboro Boys, accused in Alabama of raping two white women in 1931, and the brilliance and prophetic musical genius of Lead Belly in the Scottsboro song that was the antecedent of the anthem by Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, Wake Up Everybody, and gave us the code phrase for the Black Lives Matter movement that came, I believe, straight from the Garden of Gethsemane, reminding us especially to stay woke, stay aware, lest we sleep and wake up to find a heartless Judas in office, help me, Holy Ghost. So as Jesus left the disciples in one place, and I imagine his mother Mary and her sisters, Jesus' aunties, Mary Salome and Mary Clopas, along with Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha, were tarrying in prayer all night as the wailing women, even today. Jesus took the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and also Peter the Rock to move closer with him. Sometimes you have to have a few folks near you who earnestly have your back because folks will try all manner of evil to bring you down. So Jesus takes his close circle of friends out of the 11 disciples present and shows his humility and his vulnerability, his pain, his sorrow to those who are strong enough. Oh, you can't cry in front of everybody all the time. But in this instance, Jesus let his guard down 
and showed his humanity. Jesus began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he tells his three circle of friends, my soul is exceedingly sorrow even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. Be vigilant with me. Be aware. Stay woke. Keep your eyes open. And after Jesus makes this request, he begins to pray. God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And as a brief, as brief as this prayer was, and a short time spent in the Garden of Gethsemane, I read somewhere that it was just about one hour. For just one hour, the three, James, John, and Peter the Rock, couldn't stay vigilant. They couldn't stay woke. And Jesus declares, watch and pray lest you enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. A second time, Jesus went away and prayed, God, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus comes back and saw the three, James, John, and Peter the Rock, sleep again. So Jesus leaves for the third time, praying the same prayer, and Jesus comes back to the sleepy-headed, tired disciples. I guess Jesus had worn them out, traveling all over the place, healing folks, teaching folks, washing people's feet. They were tired, weary, and worn. Can I make a point of personal privilege? Well, I truly appreciate from the bottom of my heart those who tarry with me through this interesting time and space in which we are living. I appreciate all of those who are connected on Zoom with my mother, family, and friends, and those who watch via Facebook and YouTube. And I appreciate you. And more than that, from a distance, God is indeed watching us. Now is not the time to do what we've always done. Now is not the time to create new grudges and to get in our petty feelings or need our ego stroked or feel left out. We are in this thing together. If I hurt, you hurt. If you can't sleep, I can't sleep. If you in Gethsemane, I'm in Gethsemane. Anticipating Good Friday, but hallelujah, expecting Easter. My hope and my prayer is that one day humankind will realize sooner than later that we are connected and when the chain is broken, we break. And when we stop feeling or caring beyond our personal or political agendas or get anesthetized to pain. God help us all. But back to the text. I think Jesus was a little disappointed. He knew if anybody could stand watch, be vigilant, stay woke, these three could. I can understand Jesus' disappointment and how you must, you just want people to get it so bad, to get excited enough to keep vigilant and not become sloven. Beloved, today is not the time to not be vigilant and remember that it is in our DNA to make it from the middle passages through slavery and the Spanish flu and the lynchings and the Jim Crow and the new Jim Crow and coronavirus and classism and sexism and ageism and sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. We got this, but Lord have mercy yet and still. I can understand Jesus' disappointment day after day, week after week, preaching and teaching and folks looking at you like you're crazy. No more better off than before you came. I would imagine that Jesus must have wanted to articulate those famous three words Florida Evans cried out when she found out her husband James had been killed. Damn, 
damn, damn, damn. Oh, you want folks to catch on fire with the Holy Ghost and to be energized, but all you find are folks sleepy, zombie-like, tired, worn out, spiritually lethargic, can't even be on guard or watch for the enemy of God, sleepy while evil lurks to cause dissension and disruption. Beloved, understand me today. Betrayal is at hand always when you don't stay woke. Why? Because geez, Judas is not. I believe COVID-19 was just waiting for the interruption of our comfortably smug life and convenient star worship services. I'm convinced that COVID-19 and Judas are the same thing. I believe that hate and Judas are the same thing. I believe that racism and Judas are the same thing. I believe that political propaganda and Judas are the same thing. I believe that the power hungry and Judas are the same thing. Can I tell you about Judas? Judas had a purpose in life and he fulfilled that purpose well. Judas Iscariot was one of the disciples, the son of Simon Iscariot, the only disciple from Judea. Judas possessed a privileged position among the disciples as treasurer of the group. Judas was on the finance committee. Ever wonder why there's so much trouble when it comes to finances? It could be that there's always a Judas in the ranks. And Judas's closeness to Jesus at the Lord's Supper was because he had the money to oversee the ministry. Judas was a closeted capitalist. But why Judas betrayed Jesus is uncertain because God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. Mark writes that Judas betrayed Jesus after being convinced that Jesus truly planned to die. Matthew writes that Judas betrayed Jesus for money, 30 pieces of silver, in fact, or maybe, just maybe, Judas betrayed Jesus to help Jesus fulfill his purpose for dying. But this notion is in contradiction to John's recollection of betrayal. Beloved, the why Judas betrayed is hard to answer. What Judas betrayed is easier to answer. One suggestion is that Judas betrayed Jesus to claim to be the Messiah. Judas betrayed how Jesus could be arrested privately by singling Jesus out in Gethsemane with a kiss. But by reflecting on what he had done, Judas felt remorseful and really wanted to undo his evil. But it was impossible. This reminds me of Michael Cohen. I'm sure he's feeling like a little Judas. At least the Republican Party might be presenting Michael Cohen as Judas. But it is impossible. Jesus didn't have a cell phone or an email. Judas couldn't send out a tweet or post in TikTok or Instagram or Facebook. So Judas couldn't write an apology quickly. Sometimes, beloved, we have to think before we act. Stop before we speak. Pray before we say, and in his sorrow, Judas, the coward, hanged himself, falling headlong. His body split open and his guts fell out. Guess what? Judas was gutless. Judas was a coward. The nature of betrayal and backstabbing is usually done by those who are gutless and cowardice, who can't stand watch, who can't be vigilant, who are greedy, cunning, conniving, and wanting to control things. But the key to what happened is this. Judas didn't even have to do any of this. Jesus knew that his time had come. Jesus knew because he is God and the nature of God is to be all-knowing, omniscient, and omnipotent. Jesus knew his time had come for three years. Folks were trying to bring the brother down, but Jesus always could do the Cupid shuffle, the bus stop, and the electric slide through a crowd, heal a few folks, and slip back out again. But the hour was at hand, not because of Judas, but because of God's act of salvation and the gracious gift 
of grace. And thank God for grace. Is there any grace for the betrayer? Judas was in the church. He was one of the 12, but he was not in Christ. Did you hear what I said? Some folks might be in a church, can know all the scriptures, but they are not in Christ. But for those who believe in the way in which Jesus radically inclusive, revolutionary ministry of unconditional love for the whole world, those who truly know the Savior, there is grace, infinite, unlimited grace. God's grace in Jesus Christ is not like the trespass of this one man's sin where sin increases. Guess what? Grace increases all the more. Grace always overwhelms our sin. It was nothing but grace that marched up Golgotha. Grace that endured hostility and shame. Grace that was hung high and stretched wide. Grace that was pierced in the side. Grace helps you endure when you want to give up. Can't you see Jesus hanging in there until every one of our sins was forgiven. That's grace. God's grace is truly amazing. And I am convinced that there is a difference between thinking like God and thinking you're God. And even though Jesus, hallelujah, the very essence of God in human form gave us an idea of what the thoughts of God are especially displaying humility. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in a form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He didn't need to be called Reverend Jesus or Pastor Jesus or Dr. Jesus or Bishop Jesus, taken on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as man. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Hosanna, God save us. Hosanna, God save us. For you are the joy that my soul longs for, the lamb that was slain for my sins, and the one I adore, king of kings, ruler of everything, for your patience and kindness and favor and mercy and honor and glory because you are worthy. We can't live without you. We can't breathe without you. I can't preach without you. No greater love in this world but you. No one can compare to the things you do. Wherever you go, I will follow you. Someday every tongue shall confess. Your name, this house made of clay, shall soon pass away. And whatever the test you bring through us, Hosanna forever, we worship you. Hosanna forever, we worship Worship you, hallelujah, to the lamb that was slain for us. Dr. Hayes, come on, lead us in communion. Let's confess our sins before God. Father, we know that we have done.